The title of tonight's community event is It's About Time. We have four distinguished speakers who will present different fascinating aspects of the concept of time that will delight your senses and your intellect. They are affiliated with different departments of this university and have been pioneers in their respective fields of research. So not only do they bring along uh, the diversity of their background and the wisdom they have acquired over the years, they also bring their charismatic personalities, which should make for a colorful and inspiring evening. The subject of time is a fascinating one. We are all very conscious about it, especially when the first wrinkles or strands of gray hair suddenly appear in the mirror. Such simple signs make it too painfully obvious that there is no going back in time. But is that really the case? The famous uh, American physicist Nobel laureate uh, Richard Feynman said, time is what happens when nothing else does. Our first speaker, uh, Professor Bob Joseph, is a faculty member at the Institute for Astronomy. He will brief us on the history of time. While he might choose to address the development of the concept of time by Homo sapiens, I doubt he will come to the conclusion that the personal computer is our doom. Or will he? <laughs> so, Professor. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's with a certain amount of diffidence that I talk on this subject, the history of time, for two reasons. Firstly, Stephen Hawking, who's a lot smarter than I am, took a whole book to write a brief history of time. Even worse, I only have 15 minutes. <laughs> and um, even still, I don't know very much about this subject, I'm afraid. I do research in colliding galaxies and things like that. But I give a course uh, with one of my colleagues, Tony Cowie, on the history of the cosmos in Western culture. And so when Professor Wynne Williams was organizing this evening, he came to see me as uh, kind of the resident historian of astronomy in our institute. But I am certainly nothing more than a dilettante in, in this subject. Anyway, I'll try to uh, entertain you a little bit about ideas about time that uh, we have developed in our various cultures over the centuries. So firstly, we tend to think in the modern world that uh, time is a kind of linear sequence that flows on. And that's the common sense view of time. But that was not the concept of time for most of the ancient civilizations and for some civilizations even today, who saw time instead of being a linear progression, they saw it as a recurring cycle and things went on endlessly. So now I want to make a quick tri trip through um, how our concept of time has evolved over the centuries. So let's look first at prehistory as kind of a background. This is before things were written down. And that's what I mean by pre prehistory. Well, there are a variety of cycles in the heavens that uh, you could tell me about that the, the, our ancestors, at least back to the old Stone Age, the Paleolithic period, knew about. First of all, there's the diurnal cycle, day and night. Then uh, we know about the phases of the moon going through full moon to uh, uh, third, quarter, th third quarter and crescent and then new moon and so on, 20, 29 and a half day cycle. We also know that the sun moves through the stellar constellations through the zodiac constellation, comes back after a year. And we also, if you look a little bit more carefully at the direction the sun rises or where the sun sets, you know that it bounces back and forth between rising to the northeast or to the northwest, I'm, I'm sorry, northeast or southeast uh, of due east going from solstice to solstice. And the, the uh, ancients were aware of all of these different cycles going on in the heavens. If you want to ask yourself if they actually knew any of things just to be sure, you can find artifacts showing that they had awareness of some of these cycles as far back as 30,000 years ago. For example, here's a mammoth tusk. 
And if, because I am not an archaeologist, I would just say that's an uh, uh, they were messing about here, making little tick marks <laughs> on this piece of mammoth tusk. But if you look at it carefully, these tick marks that they've put down correspond to different phases of the moon. And in fact, this particular one records actually four months of lunar phases going from dark to full to dark again. One example, and of course another example we are all, I think, pretty much aware of is Stonehenge. These uh, giant stones of 30 to 50 tons high. Stonehenge is the most famous one of these, but there are something like 300 of these spread around in, in England and, and in Europe. And they're lined up to correspond to some of these astronomical cycles. Stonehenge was built between about 3000 and 1500 BCE. So our uh, New Stone Age ancestors knew about these astronomical cycles. Once you know about those astronomical cycles, it's easy to think that time itself is a recurring cycle. And that's what most of them did. In addition, we're also aware of a variety of natural biological rhythms that uh, would encourage a cyclic view of time. So I'm going to go now just through a few ancient civilizations to um, show you examples of uh, cyclic views of time. In the Greco-Roman world, uh, the Greeks saw time as a recurring cycle. And another cycle I haven't yet mentioned, but one that they understood, at least from the time of Hipparchus, about 200 BCE, was the precession of the equinoxes. That's an astronomical cycle that has a light, uh, time scale of about 26,000 years. And here's the way it works. If you played with a top, I guess that uh, I had one of these as a child, but I haven't seen one in a long time. They're probably all electronic or something. <laughs> but um, if you spin a top on its point, you can watch it. And as it spins, it, the spin axis goes around in a circle. That's called precession. And that's a common thing. You can see it also with a gyroscope. If you've ever given your child a gyroscope, a gyroscope does the same thing. Well, the Earth is a gyroscope or a top. It's spinning on a north-south axis. At, at how long does it take to go around once? 24 hours. So it's spinning. And it precesses, too. It goes around like this. And the time it takes to do that is about 26,000 years. So the equinox actually moves through the zodiac over the course of 26,000 years, coming around back to where it started after that time. And if you look at the direction of the spin axis to the North Star is where it is right now, that's right there at Polaris. But over that 26,000 year period, the North Pole points in this circle that is a diameter of about 46 degrees and points at different places in the sky. That's the precession of the equinoxes. And these ancient uh, civilizations knew about this. They actually had an idea. They called this precession period the great year. And um, some of those schools of thought, particularly the Stoics and the Epicureans, I believe, uh, after this 26,000 year period, there was a giant cosmic conflagration. Everything was destroyed, and the universe started over again. And you were born again, the same cities and towns appeared again, the same wars, the same droughts, etc., et, et depending on what uh, religious sect you were in. So that was one, one uh, example of uh, an astronomical cycle that was uh, uh, prominent in the ancient world. The Mayans in Central America also had an idea of time as a cycle. And they had this idea that. Uh, Different periods of time, like a day or a, a week or a month or a year, were carried by a hierarchy of divine bearers. And these people marched along on a circular road carrying a burden. And on the, those burdens were different kinds of things that would happen in the world, good things and bad things. So here are some uh, illustrations I pulled out of a book about the Mayans. Uh, some of the bearers and some of the burdens that they were carrying. But those burdens could be a drought, it could be a good harvest, and they would go through this journey and then pass off the burden as kind of a relay 
uh, on this big circular journey. And that interval of time that they would take to make the whole journey was about 260 years. So history repeated itself for the Mayans on a time scale of about 260 years. In Africa, even today, time is largely seen as a recurring cycle. Although I have to say that seasonal cycles rather than astronomical cycles seem to be more important for um, different African societies. Like many of these ancient civilizations, they use lunar-based calendars. Sometimes people use 12-month lunar calendars. Sometimes in, in Africa, they often use a 13-month calendar. Well, if you count up 13 months times uh, uh, 29 and a half days for a lunar cycle, you get, 200, you get 383 days, I think it is. And anyway, you get more days than the number of days in a year. So pretty rapidly, with this kind of calendar, the calendar year gets out of sync with the seasons. Do you see what I mean? And, and because there are extra days in, in this uh, calendar. So then they have a council meeting and have big arguments to deciding what to do. And sometimes, yes, 383 days. So sometimes they'll make corrections by adding months. Sometimes they'll make corrections by subtracting a month. And uh, so you can see that it's pretty difficult to establish a chronology of events, and certainly difficult with this kind of thinking to see time as a linear progression. Then, of course, the Eastern traditions, which I know very little about, but I read a bit about it for this lecture. Um, in the Buddhist and Hindu religions, there's a concept of time as a wheel. And this is one of the Buddhist uh, very famous wheels of time. It's made out of colored bits of sand. And it'll take a, a bunch of monks, maybe three weeks, to make one of these. And in, in Buddhism, for example, all physical changes, whether it's rain and water evaporating or uh, other physical things that happen in the world, are all seen as cycles of death and rebirth. And so in that uh, tradition, their time is viewed as a cyclical thing. And similarly, in the Hindu tradition, the creation is thought to move through four great ages of time and then the material world is recreated. Those four ages add up, I think, to something like four million in some years. But in, in both of these traditions, time is a recurring cycle when things start all over again. Well, here's one person's view. I know you can't see the, the caption on this cartoon from The New Yorker, but uh, Riley has uh, said the caption, of these two astronomers looking out at the night sky from an observatory, I've never been able to figure out the cycle of the quiet disappearance and after an indeterminate interval, the mysterious reappearance of men's trouser cuffs. <laughs> Another view of uh, cyclic time. So that's cyclic time. Now let's look at uh, the idea of time as a linear progression. One of the first suggestions that time is a linear pro 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 progression toward a goal we find in the Hebrew Bible. And that's in the historical covenants between God and the Israelite people, starting with, particularly with Abraham, where God tells Abraham he is going to make him the father of a great nation. Other covenants with David, for example, and a covenant that there will be a new golden age when a Messiah comes again. So you have a linear progression toward a goal that starts uh, with the prophets in the Hebrew Bible. And this idea of salvation history was then taken up by uh, uh, Christian thinkers, uh, starting perhaps with Augustine, St. Augustine, in the fifth century um, in, the, in the common area, or fifth century AD. And Augustine saw, similarly to this, that the unique events of religious history in the Christian tradition such as the creation, the fall, the coming of Christ, crucifixion, resurrection, progress toward an eventual reunion with God made a purely cyclic view of time untenable. And so Christianity adopted a linear progression of time, again, toward a goal with unique events that never recur again as, as part of the, the picture of time. And of course, because Christianity was the dominant uh, um, 
set of ideas in, in the Latin West from the Middle Ages uh, onward, uh, that Christian idea of time as a linear progression was absorbed into Western culture and has become part of our modern understanding of time. Then another thing that happened in the Middle Ages that contributed to this was the rise of a merchant class. In the Middle Ages, there was continual tension between time as a cycle and time as a linear progression. If you're in an agrarian society where you're planting and harvesting and so on, I don't know much about farming, but I do know that much, you're going to think in terms of cycles, aren't you, an annual cycle. Whereas uh, once the merchant class arose and there was circulation of money, people began to think of time as something valuable that was continually slipping away. In other words, what's the phrase? Time is money. And so they saw time, again, as a flow, just like water, slipping away. So with the rise of the mercantile society, this view of time as a linear flow got even more um, credence. And it turns out that in the Renaissance, uh, time began actually be, to be portrayed as a destroyer, partly because time is destroying things. De there is decay associated with time and so on. And Father Time was represented as an old man with an hourglass and a scythe, and that scythe often is associated with death. This is, happens to be taken from the rotunda of the National Gal of the Library of Congress, but that's a kind of classic Renaissance uh, portrayal of Father Time. Gary Larson also notes that Einstein eventually <laughs> figured out that time is money, as you see <laughs> from that cartoon. <laughs> I'm not quite sure of his calculation there. but. Uh, <laughs> Then another thing that happened in the Middle Ages that also reinforced the idea of time as a linear flow was the invention of mechanical clocks. A variety of religious institutions, particularly uh, monasteries and convents, needed some sort of timekeeping device to announce times for prayer and times for work schedules and, and so on. And, uh, and while people had been using water clocks and sundials since really ancient times, it was in the Middle Ages and that, that clocks came into use. Uh, the first I'm aware of a, a clock that was powered by weights driving gears was actually Muslim astron astronomers in the uh, uh, Abbasid period in, in um, the Islamic world that a mechanical clock first... Uh, was invented, but clocks became common in, in Europe. And you see clocks put in a central place, perhaps on the steeple of a church, perhaps in a central tower in, in the town where everybody could see it. The earliest clocks didn't have hands. They just announced time with bells. But then clocks started having hands, and for a long time, they had just one hand. Um, a friend of mine used to always say that one hand was all you actually needed on a clock. That was human time. Anything more precise was uh, overdoing it. And um, considering how unprompt she tended to be, I think that she was at least uh, consistent. Uh, oh, I just told you all that stuff. So here's an example of a medieval clock uh, from a, a building in Poland. And you can see this has just one hand. <clears throat> and because the clock could theoretically, in a way, tick away forever, just keep going as long as you wound it, you had the sense that uh, time was linear and continuous and could flow on forever. So the historians of science say that the invention of the mechanical clock in the Middle Ages also contributed to our modern idea of a linear progression of time. Uh, Matt Stevens in The New Yorker also seems to see that the dawn of time came with the invention of a mechanical, mechanical clock. Here's the horizon. <laughs> well, finally, we come to uh, 
the, the beginnings of the scientific revolution with Isaac Newton. Galileo had studied motion in a landmark uh, book, The Discourses on the Two New Sciences, published just shortly before he died while he was still under house arrest. <clears throat> and he had implicit in his book, but not explicitly, the idea of a uniform time which, which flows onward. Uh, about uh, 30 years later, Isaac Barrow, who was a professor, he was the first Lucassian professor at Cambridge. Stephen Hawking is now the current Lucassian professor, but Isaac Barrow was the first professor of this chair set up by somebody named Lucas. And uh, Barrow, in his geometrical lectures at Cambridge in the 1660s, um, made, made this idea more explicit. And I've actually written it for you, what he said. Um, whether things move or are still, whether we sleep or awake, time pursues the even tenor of its way. In other words, it just flows on and on. Well, he was the, uh, the teacher of Isaac Newton, who was um, an absolute um, um, landmark figure. And in, in Newton's magnum opus, The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, he took this idea and made it even more explicit that time, as well as space, are absolute. And I wanted to have you read that, even though it may be a little bit out of character for a lecture of this sort, but I want you to see what Newton said. Absolute true and mathematical time of itself and from its own nature flows equably without relation to anything external. Relative, apparent, and common time is any sensible and external measure of duration by means of motion. In other words, like a clock. Such a measure, for example, an hour, a day, a month, a year, is commonly used instead of true time. So clocks are doing something that approximates the real true time. In other words, time has an independent existence. It is just as real as space. And the events that we have happen in space also uh, uh, take place in time, and time itself is, is real. Now, there's been a lot of arguing about Newton's ideas of absolute space and absolute time. And I don't want to get into those too much, but uh, uh, it turns out there are some philosophical problems with both of them. But, and Newton admitted you can't actually see absolute space or absolute time, but you can measure motion with respect to both of those. And so he argued that these are actually real. Anyway, Newton was a towering figure, and uh, his idea of time became the dominant understanding of time in the 17th century and pretty much through until the 20th century. And in fact, this idea of time is the idea of time that is in mathematical, mathematical physics, which is kind of the paradigmatic uh, formulation of uh, how science should be formulated, in my humble opinion. In any case, as Richard Feynman put it, and, um, and Professor Habal just mentioned, time is what happens when nothing else does. That's, that's what, what Newton is saying. So in summary then, in the ancient world, time was seen as cyclic, in analogy to these natural rhythms we're aware of in nature in the Latin West, particularly due to the rise of Christianity and the fact that it was the dominant force in the culture for many centuries, uh, with the emphasis on unique events in, in Christian history, uh, the idea of time as a linear progression became the dominant idea. Mechanical clocks only encouraged that, and did the rise of a mercantile economy with the idea of a linear flow of time. Newton then finally argued that time is a linear progression which has independent existence and continues on inexorably, no matter what else you do. And I would say this is the common sense view of time, and it's the idea of time used in mathematical physics. Now, my next, the next speaker, my colleague John Leonard, is going to show how this idea of absolute time, which Newton had, was modified by Einstein in, two, in, uh, in, um, two, in 1905 with his theory of relativity. So then I'll leave you with this cartoon by Richter, which gives another slant on the concept of a linear progression of time. 
this uh, elderly gentleman is saying to his wife, for good reasons, for reasons I need not go into just now, Marjorie, I have decided to wear a button-down collar all the rest of the way. Thank you very much. So I, I forgot to mention that we will hold the questions and answers after the end of all the, the lectures. So thank you very much, Bob. Uh, after these insights into the history of time, you might feel thrown into opposing extremes, as expressed by E.E. E. Cummings. So what time is it? It is by every star a different time, and each mo most falsely true or so subhumans, sub superminds declare. <laughs> Our next speaker, Professor John Learned, is a professor of physics, and like some physicists, he belongs to the rare group of subhuman sumer superminds. <laughs> he will address a more worrisome idea, namely, do some people age faster than others? Sorry, yes. Good evening. So I get to take up, the, take up the story at the beginning of the 20th century and uh, lead you on the world's shortest course in relativity. <laughs> and so let's see where that laser pointer went. Here we go. So this is, uh, many recognize this as a, a botched up Escher picture with <laughs> Starbucks everywhere. You know. <laughs> no matter where you go and which way you're tilted. This was the first experiment that showed that, as we'll talk about, light has the same speed wherever you measure it. From whatever place you're measuring it, you will get one velocity for the velocity of light. This is the Michelson-Morley experiment, and it measured the velocity of light going one direction and the other direction on the Earth and found it was the same thing. So my title was, My Clock Runs Faster Than Your Clock Because of the Dilation of time that if you look on a moving spaceship, as we'll talk about, it seems like the clocks run slower. It's also true that sticks on a spaceship appear to be shorter. So I was, the other part of the title is in my rod is longer than your rod, but they wouldn't <laughs> let me do that. So, uh, Here's the short course in relativity, so bear with me. This will be the only equations that I'll show you. And this is, this is high school physics, and I think we can do it. So you probably, if you've had high school physics when they talked about relativity, you've all seen this game before. Talk about a moving train. In fact, it has to be an awful lot faster than the train to, to see any relativistic effects. And someone, the observer sitting in the station, say, seeing the train go by, and imagine having two mirrors on the train with a light beam bouncing back and forth, and the clock ticks every time the light bounces back and forth. So distance is equal to speed times time. So this is, say, centimeters equals centimeters per second times centimeters, uh, seconds equals centimeters. So this gives you a distance. Then the person sitting in the train station will see, instead of this, they'll see the, light, the mirror moving as the train goes by. And the mirror will move in proportion to the speed of the train. So if the train speed is V, and the time that we see for the ticking of the clock in the train station is T0, then the distance that the train will have traveled is V times T0. So we have a triangle, and everybody learned in high school geometry, how to solve a triangle, just the good old Pythagorean theorem. So we have d squared is equal to little d squared plus l squared, and then if I substitute in uh, ct sub zero, ct on the train, and I have this little equation, and then I just go through this equation and solve it, I get the following equations which have a really long tail to them, which is that the observer sees uh, the time uh, on the train stretched by this gamma factor. And this relativistic gamma factor is, is this. It's one over the square root of one minus 
the relative velocity compared to light of this train squared. So you can see that when this thing is zero, then this is just one, so the time is equal to the time in both places when the velocity is small. But when V gets close to C, this is near one, this is near zero, and as you know, dividing by zero gives you infinity. So then the gamma factor gets to be huge. So here is what happens. This is a graph of this. This is the velocity going between zero velocity and the speed of light, and this gamma factor, for most of the time, even when you're going really quite fast, it's not doing much at all, but near the end, then it just goes crazy. And this has all kinds of implications. So uh, now I'm gonna talk about some uh, applications of some consequences of relativity, and there'll be kind of a, a random scattering of a few things that we can talk about in this short amount of time. So the first thing that is so mind-boggling is that clocks do, do appear to run faster or slower depending on your system. And the clocks in the moving train do appear to be moving slower. And so we'll talk more about this in the next slide or two. Another thing that, that follows immediately from this is the idea of simultaneity is no longer so obvious. And the typical kind of physics one lecture demonstration of that is the person standing here seeing lightning hitting two trees simultaneously from his point of view, persons on a very fast bus see them occurring at different times. So simultaneity, and you can make a much longer story about this, but simultaneity has a different interpretation in when one understands relativity. And, 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 and to go back, remember that the assumption at the start of this, and you can derive almost everything from the one assumption that the velocity of light is whatever it is, three times 10 to the eighth, 300 million meters per second, no matter where you measure it, you'll always get the same answer. So with a little more algebra and so on, you can write down that E is equal to mc squared and this gamma factor that I showed you before. Now, when I make, when gamma is not very much different from one, when the velocity is low, I can write this as approximately mc squared plus one half mv squared. Now, you all have heard, E equal mc squared. That's what Einstein was famous for. E is equal to mc squared. But there's the rest of the term. There's the one half mv squared, and that's the kinetic energy. One half mv squared is when you run your car into a barrier at twice the speed, it's got four times the energy, going to do an awful lot more damage. Or if the brakes fail on your train, <laughs> you're liable to come out the end of the station. The mc squared part was what was so mind-blowing at the turn of the century, and it still is, that energy and mass are the same thing. That somehow or other, if we can convert mass, we can get an astounding amount of energy out of it. C is a big number, so C squared is a really big number, and this energy is fantastic. And this is what led to things like nuclear reactors, which are much more efficient than chemical reactors and squeezing energy out of things. And it led to, for example, appropriate to talking about IFA events, the understanding of how the stars burn. We didn't know how the stars burn until uh, 75 or 80 years ago or so. Uh, and, and we now have great models of how the stars burn and evolve. There are just vast implications all across science, and moreover, must be asserted to you that this is, there's just no question that relativity works. There are some cranks around that are always saying, well, you know, blah, 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 Einstein, uh, I don't know, I don't know. But the facts are you just can't escape it. You just can't. So next slide. So uh, I want to tell you about an example of, uh, of how we can see right in this room tonight that relativity works. There's particles called muons that are made. Cosmic rays come in and hit the atmosphere. They make a flock of secondary particles. And then there are some longer lived particles that continue on. And the main species that get to the surface of the Earth here are these things called muons and my favorite subject of study, neutrinos, 
that I don't get to talk about tonight. And the, the muons are coming through us all the time here. There's about 100 muons per square meter per second going through us here at the surface of the Earth. And these muons have a lifetime. If you have one here in the laboratory, you measure the lifetime. These guys, their lifetime is about 2.2 microseconds. There it goes. So every time this guy beeps, there's a cosmic ray going through it. This is a little cosmic ray counter. There's two scintillation paddles here and photomultiplier tubes. And so when a particle goes from here to here, uh, in coincidence, there's a cosmic ray has come down all the way through the building, right on generally into the ground, and it's going click, click, click. You can see one every second or two, and just random. So this is a picture of that here. And I better turn it off before it drives everybody crazy. <laughs> so uh, these muons are pervasive, and the, the thing, the point here is that living 2.2 microseconds, traveling at the speed of light, they'd only go about 2,000 feet. They're made in the atmosphere up at high, a little higher than aircraft altitudes and so on, and they generally wouldn't make it to the surface of the Earth. Uh, but in fact, if the typical muon has 20 times the, its rest mass, this gamma factor is 20, so they live 44 microseconds. If you multiply that times the speed of light, they can travel from airplane altitudes down to the surface, and they get here. And in fact, there are higher energies, and they get way down deep in the ground, uh, into the deepest tunnels in the ground. And people have even set up experiments. Some people from the University of Texas are setting up an experiment to X-ray one of the Mayan tombs using this technique. And it's been used in the past, Louis Alvarez and company in the great temple of Sephron in Egypt many years ago did the same thing to look for hidden cavities. So these muons are here. The point of the message is simply that if it weren't for relativity, for the clock running slow as we see it in, in the muon, then it wouldn't live long enough to get to the surface of the earth. So relativity is seen every day here on earth. So here's a little fun. What, what would happen if you got onto a nice spaceship like the Enterprise here that had an acceleration of 1G, that's to say accelerating fast enough that it pressed you back in your seat by the equivalent of gravity, be comfortable, you'd enjoy life, and you start sailing away and keeping the pedal to the metal at 1G, how fast would you be going? Well, after say 2.337 years, the elapsed time on Earth would be 5.127 years, and the distance traveled would be 4.223 years, and you would be at Proxima Centauri, our nearest neighbor star. Okay, well, that's nice. So after four years or so, you'd be at the brightest star. You could be at the range of the brightest stars in a different direction, Vega. After 6.6 .6 years, you'd be out to the Pleiades, which, which were a goodly ways out. 367 light years, but interestingly, now you're, you're really picking up velocity. You're starting to get up near the speed of light. By the time 11 years has passed, you've reached a distant equivalent to going to the center of the galaxy. That would, of course, be a really bad idea <laughs> because there's a lot of stuff down there, including a giant black hole, and you might regret having gone in that direction. <laughs> might be the end of your trip. If you went in another direction toward the Andromeda galaxy, our nearest major spiral galaxy, after only 15 years in your time on the spaceship, haven't gotten much older, sipping martinis, flying along, suddenly there's Andromeda. And you keep on cruising and speed is picking up. But what's happening is your clock in the rest frame from here is getting slower and slower and slower. And things are starting to flash by and carrying this on through the, here's our nearby Virgo cluster, here's the Coma cluster, 100 million light years out. And then finally, after only 25 or so years old, 25 or so years past, you'd be long enough that many of us would survive it, you would be at the edge of the observable universe. That's just astounding. You could see the whole, you could live to see the whole universe. Little problem. 
because by the time you turned around and came back, if you could decelerate fast enough and so on, and came back, the galaxy might not be here. <laughs> so here's a scheme of how to live forever. Well, not quite forever, but a long time. There, you've all heard that the, this big accelerator is being turned on Switzerland. There's the Alps, and it, it's underground here, crossing the border between France and Switzerland. And it'll accelerate protons, the nuclei of hydrogen, up to energies about 10,000 times their rest mass. This famous gamma factor is 10,000. So if you could ride with one of these protons, you could live a really, really long time. So, of course, it would be a little tough on a sh in a tight radius like that. So we'd have to make the accelerator much bigger, put it in space, say, around the solar system. And uh, you ride on this, you could survive for about 800,000 years on this. You still are only going to get 80 years in your, own, in your own time. It doesn't, you can't do anything about that. You're stuck with whatever your lifetime is, 80, 100 years. One second on board the, air, the craft in this thing would be 2.8 hours on Earth. You could just see your friends growing old in one day. So the bad news is that even though the physics, I think, per perfectly well permits all of this, the power to accelerate to these energies is far more than we could conceive of in this day and age. Still. Sometime in the far future, who knows, maybe we put capsules into some sort of orbit where intelligences man manage to live for a really long time. Interesting to think about. Uh, another little tidbit in this story is that, as you know, Mr. Einstein, the relativity was all about saying that the velocity of light is the same wherever you measure it. So here on the spaceship, on the moon, center of the galaxy, whatever, you'll always get C, 310 to the eighth meters per second. But now we know that there is, in fact, one rest frame. And by rest frame, we mean the velocity with respect to everything else. We know there is one set of velocities which is really at rest in the universe. And through these measurements, starting in Kobe and along with uh, more recent measurements, we saw that there was a big asymmetry. You'll hear more later about the variations in this that tell us about structure in the Big Bang. But this is looking back at the CMBRs, Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, at the beginning of the universe, 13.7 billion years ago. But what we see is a big dipole, as we call it, dipole term. Big asymmetry, because we're going in the direction, in one direction, and going away from the other direction. And we're moving at an amazing speed. 620 kilometers per second in sort of an unobvious direction. It's not pointing toward anything in particular. Even though it's quite a good speed, it's about a thousandth of the speed of light. Gamma is, the famous gamma is 1.05. I have to stutter a lot to say that. So what it does mean, though, is that our clocks run slower by 15 seconds per year. You say, whoa, well, you know, big deal. But heck. After a lifetime, you got an extra two minutes that way. So <laughs> let's hear it for having a good snappy solar system. Next. So here are some things that Mr. Einstein in relativity tells us, and general relativity tells us you can't do. Uh, sadly for uh, science fiction, a lot of these things. There was a young lady named Bright whose speed was far faster than light. She went out one day in a relative way and came home the previous night. <laughs> I've, I've heard another version of that, which I think is not appropriate for you. <laughs> but in any case, you get in all kinds of trouble if you can go faster than the speed of light. You can't, for instance, this is a poster from Back to the Future, of course, you can't reverse time. Uh, time flies, and it flies in only one direction. And there's not much you can do about it. You can run your clock backwards, but you can't change the flow of time, and we can't change the regular, regularity of the flow of time. 
Uh, you can't beat the speed of light with any information. You often see in the press, somebody says, oh, we did an experiment, we got faster than the speed of light. But the thing you should ask them right away is, but did you transfer any information? I can make faster than light speed of light in this room by just wiggling this laser across the wall. That spot can move faster than the speed of light. Big deal. No information went at faster than the speed of light. So who knows what SCN is? Subspace Communication Network. Where are you Trekkies? <laughs> this is, is the decoder for it here. <laughs> so uh, Captain Kirk couldn't talk to whom? Not very fast at any rate. So we don't see any chance for that. I have to make one caveat though, which is that uh, there are some theories of, with extra dimensions and so on that might allow some fooling with this, but as far as we know now, there's no way around it, absolutely no way around it. Uh, another thing that people talk about are wormholes. You all remember Contact and uh, Carl Sagan's novel and the movie. And uh, people started working on the idea of wormholes, which is a connection in the multi-dimensional geometry that is between two places and that you might be able to jump from one place to another. It makes wonderful science fiction, but it seems as though in, it could perhaps be done, but it requires an infinite amount of energy and no information can pass through. So forget all those nice pictures of looking through into another part of space and time. It doesn't look like it can possibly work. Even more um, depressing is that a rapid dialogue with even the nearest stars is not going to be much fun. It won't be an exciting dialogue <laughs> as it takes 20 years or so round trip to even the nearest star into the galactic center, it'll take you 50,000 years to get a response. That's one slow conversation. So down to the end, what things can you do? <laughs> what can you do? Uh, one of the best examples of talking about the influence of relativity, both special and general relativity, is uh, talking about these terrific devices, the global positioning system that probably some of you have in your cars, take hiking here and there, our friends use for surveying, all kinds of things, uh, marking out the locations of plants as my wife does, that these things depend upon both special and general relativity. This is distance in kilometers, so this is 40,000 kilometers out, and this is the uh, fractional change in frequency relative to the Earth, and uh, so it's about one, here is one part in 10 to the 10th. That's pretty big compared to the accuracy of clocks these days. And so at GPS in Glasnost, the Russian satellite system and the geostationary orbit, it's a pretty big effect. This effect is dominantly general relativity, folks. This effect down here is special relativity. And there's one place here where they offset each other. So we have to put those things in numerically every day and there are more examples of that. So uh, I say that uh, reaching the conclusion, we, we certainly get to glory in the emerging understanding of our place in the universe. The, we, we've been through the, the trials of being at the center of the universe. We're learning that we went around the sun, learning that we uh, are just a minor star and the outside of a so-so galaxy and a outside of a big cluster, nowhere special in the universe. Now we're not even part of the dark matter or let alone the dark energy that's the most part of the universe. We should be humbled, but it's incredible that we have come within the last hundred years to understand all of this stuff from this astounding combination of elementary particle physics to cosmology, the smallest to the grandest scales. We're beginning to make sense of our place in this universe. And I say, and, but don't forget your friends. And, and I add one little caveat for you to think about is that not much talked about is that our physics, much as it describes many things in elementary particle physics and so on, does not have a role for the feedback effects of intelligence on the fate of the universe. So when you hear people talking about that, there's a very interesting little catch in all that that might be important in the end. So I put in a cartoon about the arc of phylogeny of we're talking about arcs or linear time, this is a, <laughs> so here we are now. So I say, live fast and die old.
click. <laughs> Well, after this talk by John, you might feel to totally discombobulated as St. Augustine did when he said, if nobody asks me, I know what time it is, but if I am asked, then I am at a loss what to say. So if you thought you had a hard time keeping track of your children's or spouse's birth dates, then Klaus Kyle, a professor at the Hawaii Institute for Geophysics and Planetology, has the answer for you. Just look at some of the smallest objects in the solar system. Okay, thank you very much. My topic is the time of formation of the solar system. Or with other words, how old is our world and how fast was it put together? And that is a very exciting question. And uh, uh, in the last 50 years or so, we have learned more about the origin of our solar system than mankind has in all its past history. And this is due to many factors. One of them is that we have sent spacecraft to the star, our sun, and to the eight planets, to many of the moons, and we've even looked with spacecraft at asteroids and at comets. We have built better telescopes, some of them are flying in space, and particularly we have made enormous progress in a study of meteorites, rocks that fall from the sky. What is a meteorite? They're solid bodies of extraterrestrial material that penetrate our atmosphere and reach the surface and are recovered. Hawaii, of course, is a small place, so we haven't been pelted by meteorites, but there were two. Honolulu meteorite fell in 1825 when the missionaries had just arrived here and, uh, and described the fall very in great detail. And then the Palolo Valley meteorite fell in 1949 in Palolo Valley, penetrated the roof of a house, the ceiling of a house, and fell in the bed where a young man was sleeping. And the young man was not hurt. Now, most meteorites that fall on our planet are actually impact-produced fragments of small bodies, small baby planets, which we call asteroids. The largest today is about 600 miles in diameter, and in principle, they orbit the sun, just like the planets. You're looking down on our solar system here, counterclockwise, basically between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And there are literally thousands and thousands. Why are they significant? They're significant because they are small baby planets that are left over from the dawn of our solar system, from the birth of our solar system. And by studying these meteorites and their constituents, we can actually very precisely determine what the conditions were like in the solar nebula from which our solar system formed. And we, by dating <coughs> constituents of the meteorites, we can determine the time the solar system formed and how long it actually took to put together. Now, I have to uh, introduce this thing is very difficult. <clears throat> I have to introduce you a little bit to meteorite jargon. Meteorites in our collections, over 25,000, in principle, come from two different types of asteroids. First type are primitive, primitive in the sense that their constituents are today like they were when the solar system came about. And they were unmelted. They may have been heated a little bit, but they never melted. They're unadulterated early solar system material. The meteorites that we have from those primitive asteroids are called chondrites because they contain these round objects, which we call chondrules. Chondros is the Greek word for sphere. This is a section of one of the meteorites, never mind the, the, the name of it. And it is actually imaged in a scanning electron microscope in magnesium, red, calcium, green, and aluminum, blue, K-alpha x-rays. And then these colors have been overlaid. And so you can tell, for example, this object, which is designated CAI, 
calcium aluminum rich inclusion is full of green stuff, calcium, and blue stuff, aluminum, whereas these contours are very rich in magnesium because they are red. Now, it is important for you to, to remember these two terms, calcium aluminum rich inclusions and contours. I will show you data where these objects have been dated. And it turns out that these CAIs, they're full of very high temperature uh, minerals condensed first from the solar nebula a long, long time ago, and they actually date the, very, the, the appearance of the very first solid materials that formed from the solar nebula. Two million years later, I will show you these controls formed two, three million years later. They then accreted and they formed little baby planets, little asteroids. This is the significance of these contritic, primitive, unmelted asteroids. Now, there are others. They started out contritic, but they were heated and they melted due to radioactive decay of what we call short life radionuclides, which put an enormous amount of energy into an object in a very short time period so that even small asteroids would totally melt. You've all heard about what a cross section of the Earth is like. If you were to take a cross section of the Earth, you would find a metal core, a silicate mantle rich in iron and magnesium, and on the surface, a crust of basalt, like here in Hawaii. Asteroids are the same way. This is a fragment of the core of an asteroid, a metallic iron core. The boundary between the core and the mantle is made up of silicate stuff and metal. Incidentally, I've brought a couple of meteorites along. You can look at these later on. Here's an example. This is the symbol for aluminum. Aluminum of the, ma aluminum of the mass of 26 decays into magnesium of the mass of 26. Now, not with a half-life of billions of years, but only 0.72 million years, 720,000 years. We can measure these small excesses of magnesium 26 from the decay of aluminum 26 in calcium aluminum rich inclusions or in contours and plot them up in a diagram here. Never mind the details. This is the ratio of 26 to 24, and this is 26 aluminum to 27 uh, aluminum. The point is, like in the previous slide, the slope of this line is a measure of the age. For this particular meteorite, the ratio of aluminum 26 to aluminum 27 is 6.3 times 10 to the minus 6, or down here, I've done it, we've done it in a different scale, uh, it's in 10 to the minus 5, so this is 0, 0 0.63 times 10 to the minus 5. It's this particular point. In this diagram is plotted the aluminum content, the initial aluminum content as a function of absolute age. We can anchor these data with an absolute age, like I showed you with the potassium uh, argon uh, method here, and this is in millions of years. If I had plotted here the aluminum 26-27 ratio for these CAIs, the oldest material, when the aluminum 26 had just been added to the solar system, the data would plot along this line. Anything here below that line is younger by a few million years. And you notice that this particular meteorite, its contours are about two million years younger than the calcium aluminum rich inclusions. That is to say, while these things formed, I'm sorry, while these things formed 4.56 billion years ago, the contours formed a few million years later. I should say that these are measurements done by my colleagues, uh, uh, Gary Huss, uh, Sasha Krut, and Kazu uh, Nagashima in our laboratory. These are earlier measurements from Caltech, for example, and you notice the error bars are much higher than our error bars. And the reason for that is we have an instrument that is second to none. This, this is Sasha Krut and Kazu Nagashima. 
this is called an ion microprobe. There's only two in the United States. Ours was purchased two years ago for $3.8 million with grants from NASA, the, uh, the Keck Foundation, and some other sources, and it is in our institute. The principle of this machine is that we use a focused ion beam, high energy, 10 keV, that hits, say, a CAI, sputters material off that object, uh, secondary ions, and they are taken into a mass spectrometer, which is nothing but a huge magnet that separates the ions based on the mass charge ratio. And this way, we can determine these aluminum magnesium isotopic uh, uh, anomalies to a very, very high degree. I mean, it is astonishing when you think about it, how accurate this can be done. Here is a summary of what I wanted to say. Let's look at the right-hand side first. This is the time bar for our solar system, uh, for our universe. The meteorites fall on Earth today. We take them apart. We determine the ages by these methods that I just explained, both in CAIs, in contours, and in melted basaltic asteroids. Look at the numbers that we get. The CAI, and when I say we, I mean the royal we. There's a lot of people that have participated in this work. It isn't all done at the University of Hawaii. Uh, the CAIs are 4,567.2 million years old. The error bar, 700,000 years. It's absolutely incredible that one can date something that is that old with that accuracy. As I showed you in the previous slide, two, two slides previous, controls are a little bit younger. See, there are 4,564.7 4, 4, million years old, about two million years younger. So you have to imagine a solar nebula in which calcium and aluminum rich inclusions were circling around the star, including two million years later, contours. And they then accreted and formed the baby planets from, from which we get chondritic meteorites. Some of these baby planets melted, and here's an age of one of those basalts. Look, it's still about two million years younger than the contours, four or five million years younger than the CAIs. What this means is that the solar nebula must have been around for at least five million, six, ten million years at the most. During this time, the gas condensed into solids, the solids accreted into little baby planets. The, they melted, some of them melted, others did not. And those, all this happened in the first 10 million years of solar system history. So the solar system is very old, but it was put together in a great hurry. And those asteroids, of course, or similar objects served as the embryos that formed the terrestrial planets. I've indicated two other numbers here to give you a feeling for the age of the universe. Our solar system is part of the Milky Way galaxy, 10,000, which is estimated to have formed 10,000 million years ago. 10,000 million years ago, 10 billion years ago. This is an estimate. So is the age of the universe. Big Bang is thought to have happened 13,700 million years ago. So these are estimates, but these are absolutely hard numbers. Now, in this cartoon, and that's the last thing I want to say, is a summary of how we think elements are formed, stars formed, and planetary systems form. In all the elements that make up our world, even the elements, magnesium, iron, silicon, in your body were once made in the interior of big stars by what a process called nucleosynthesis. Hydrogen atoms were pressed together by, due to high pressure, high temperature, formed a new element, et cetera, et cetera. The heavy, this is how the heavy elements were made. Eventually, these red giants and supernova blew up at the end of their lifetime. Everything in, in our universe has a lifetime, a limit. And this material that when they blew up, the gases were distributed into the interstellar space. In the process, some materials 
condensed and formed solids, which we can also store, study. That's another talk. These are so-called pre-solar grains. And they form huge molecular clouds, cold molecular clouds that you can see in the sky. Eventually, parts of these molecular clouds contract and collapse and form a new star, such as our sun. And the colder material forms planets, the asteroids. Asteroids collide, pieces fall on the Earth, and we study them. That is the cycle. Now, our sun is a middle-aged star. It has another four and a half billion years or so to live. What is going to happen to our solar system after that? The same thing that happened to these stars. The solar system will collapse. The material, the elements in the solar system, including the elements that make up your body, will be distributed into interstellar space. Another molecular cloud will form. Eventually, another star will form. And a new planet system, if you're lucky, will form. So in a sense, you and I will live forever. The elements that make up your body were made in stars, perhaps as long as 10 billion years ago. But they will continue to live even when our solar system collapses. So this is just one example of the very exciting things that we have been able to find out by the study of asteroidal meteorites. Thank you. OK, just as you started to feel more rooted after Klaus's talk, you might still have the sneaky feeling, uh, to quote Douglas Adams, that time is an illusion, lunchtime doubly so. <laughs> In fact, you might recall that John tried to convince you that you cannot reverse time. Gareth Wynne Williams, who was a faculty at the IFA, will now show you how astronomers have this incredible power of looking back in time. So our first speaker, uh, Bob Joseph, talked about uh, the fact that different cultures have, different, have had different ideas about the nature of time. And what I want to do is to try to show you how uh, astronomers have tried to address this. Some particular questions such as, um, did time start at some point? Uh, does, time does time cycle? Or does time uh, run forever? And so what I'll try to do is to conv convince you that there are actually scientific ways of looking at this. The first real evidence that the universe itself had an origin, uh, that's that, on top of the whole universe, not talking about the solar system, which is what uh, Klaus was talking about. The, the ev first evidence that the whole universe had a, uh, an origin dates back to the, about the 1930s, where Edwin Hubble uh, discovered that almost all galaxies are moving away from us. He used uh, what's called the Doppler shift to estimate the speed of galaxies. And what he found is now referred to as Hubble's law, the more distant a galaxy is, the faster it is moving away from us. And that's illustrated rather badly here. What one sees is all, all the galaxies uh, moving apart. Uh, we can only watch galaxies from our own location. But if you think about uh, the way the universe is expanding, you find that um, the, the sort of law that Hubble found uh, is applicable everywhere in the universe. The simplest interpretation uh, of Hubble's, uh, that the expansion that Hubble sees is that the whole universe is expanding uniformly. And this leads to the, quite naturally to the idea of a Big Bang, that there was an origin of the universe sometime back in the past. Uh, I'll come back to uh, ask, looking at um, alternatives to the Big Bang a little bit later. But first, let's uh, look at the sort of observations that Hubble was making and see how we can get an estimate for the age of the universe. And to get an idea how we do this, let me give you a very simple high school math problem here. Two cars moving away from each other at um, 30 miles an hour each. If they're 60 miles apart and they've been moving at a constant speed, how long ago did they start their journey? <coughs> One hour. Good. That was very, very simple, I hope. Uh, answer is an hour. The same principle is the way we use to determine the age of the universe. If we assume that galaxies have been moving at the same speed, uh, we, we measure distances, and we find, as Klaus just told you, that the age to time since the Big Bang, if the galaxies have been moving uniformly, is about 13.7 billion years. 
And to give you a feel, that's three times the age of the solar system that Klaus just uh, gave you. But was there really a Big Bang? Well, um, in the, so the 1950s, 1960s, when uh, people were thinking about uh, Hubble's results, uh, an alternative theory was proposed uh, quite seriously by some very eminent uh, mathematical astronomers, Fred Hoyle, Tommy Gold, Herman Bondi, uh, and they proposed something called the steady state theory. Now, for reasons I'll give you in a minute, we don't, people, people don't believe the steady state theory anymore, but it's very interesting to think about how uh, one can approach this question. The steady state theory is mathematically the simplest theory of cosmology. And uh, Hoyle was a, a mathematical astronomer, and his, he postulates that the universe has no beginning, or had no beginning, and has no end. Uh, the, he accepts, the, the astronomers accept that the galaxies are moving apart, but they postulate that matter is created continuously by some process, and that matter makes new galaxies to fill the gaps. So the average density of the universe is always about the same. Now, this statement here, matter is created to fill the gaps, that should upset anyone who's taken high school chemistry, where one learns the law of conservation of mass. However, if you do the math here and ask how much new matter do you need to create to fill the gaps uh, as Hubble's galaxies move apart, it's approximately one hydrogen atom per cubic mile per year. And there aren't any measurements that have been ever been made of the law of conservation of mass that are accurate enough to tell it. So there's no, there's, there's no, no real argument to get, you can't argue against this theory on the grounds that you don't like the idea that matter is created. Um, any, kind, any theory of the cosmology has to have matter created. Um, the steady state theory just does it continuously. Okay, how can we test this theory? And I want to show you that there, there are several tests of it. Um, and what I want to show you is the first one that was done, which is not, not actually the most powerful one that we have, but it's perhaps the simplest one to understand. And it shows, illustrates a nice way that, that astronomy works. Let's imagine that we have a region of space containing galaxies. Each of these little white smudges is a galaxy, and you'll see there's a typical kind of separation here. It's probably about six inches on the wall, rather bigger in, in real life, of course. <laughs> now. With telescopes, astronomers are picking up light or other kinds of radiation from space. That radiation has been traveling at the speed of light. Obviously, light travels at the speed of light. So if we look at a very distant galaxy, a galaxy that's, say, a million light years away, we are seeing that galaxy as it was a million years ago. So astronomers are able to look back in time, and that we do this we do this very often. It's very often, uh, very frequently, one of the things we do in studying the universe is to look at distant objects because we are looking back in time. That's, if, if, if our present galaxy, if present universe looks a bit like this, what, is it, what should it look like in the past according to these theories? Well, according to the steady state theory, the universe is always about the same density. So the distant parts of the universe should look like this, typically about the same separation between galaxies. These are not the same galaxies, but on average, it'll match. The Big Bang theory says that in the past, the galaxies were closer together, since the universe is expanding, and the universe should look like this. The distant universe should look like this. Well, we, we do this. There are ways we can use telescopes to do this. And what do we find? We find that the steady state theory does not fit the observations. Looking back in time, the galaxies were closer together in the past. In other words, the Big Bang wins. So this is direct observational um, uh, evidence for the Big Bang. And I should say that nowadays, almost all astronomers and physicists accept the Big Bang theory for cosmology. But we should remember the words of a uh, famous uh, Russian theoretical physicist, Lev Landau, who commented the following, cosmologists are often in error, but never in doubt. <laughs> and one should Bear that in mind. OK, so let, we, we had a big bang. So let's think about what happened at time zero. Well, we don't know what happened at time zero, but the interesting thing is that we can get very, very close to time zero. And to make sense of what has happened, to make sense of what happens at around the time of the big bang, what, we, what the physicists and astronomers tend to do is we try to give much more emphasis to the very early times, and we try to stretch out the, what happened in the early part of the universe so we can understand it better. 
And the way we do this mathematically is, call, is called plotting a logarithmic graph. And so this is really what the Big Bang looks like for physicists. All right, and I'll explain what this is here. This is a logarithmic graph in the sense that we, we're, now we're right here, and we're looking back in time. And each one of these little ticks represents a factor of 10 smaller time. So we go back to uh, the, the time here is the time since time zero, the Big Bang. So here we have a thousand years after the Big Bang. We have a, a year, 10 years, 100 years, 1,000, 100,000, up to a billion years. Here's 10 billion years. So the origin of the solar system is about here and now is about there. They're separated by about one pixel. I'm, I'm sorry, Klaus, I've reduced your uh, talk to one pixel on my graph. <laughs> But what we're doing here is we're, we're spreading out time back to the real time zero. We never actually get to time zero. But this is what physicists are thinking about the Big Bang. Because what, what is so remarkable about cosmology and physics is that to try to understand the very, very big of the whole universe, we have to understand things on a very, very small scale. For example, if we use the laws of physics as we understand it and extrapolate backwards, we find, find that at about a million years, the universe was made up of, of atoms. There were no galaxies. The atoms were more, like, more or less like a hot gas. We go farther back, they get hotter and hotter. The, the, that gas tends to become ionized here. We, here we go back before we make any elements. We just have protons, electrons, neutrinos, etc. We go back, we have things called quarks. We're now talking about a millionth of a second after the Big Bang. Okay, and it, what, what, okay this is an oxymoron. It's enormously minute time, but... Uh, <laughs> That's the way to think about the universe. The universe is an enormously minute place here. We go back to the area of quarks, and out of interest, um, uh, who was it? There was, uh, John talked about the uh, uh, Large Hadron Collider, that new accelerator in Switzerland. Uh, the experiments that it will be doing are largely to try to explain what's happening around a billionth or a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. We go back even farther, and we're going back here. This is about 10 to the minus, if you like numbers, 10 to the minus 43 of a second. Um, we might as well call this the area of era of complete ignorance, um, in the sense that uh, the laws of physics as we understand them just are completely self-contradictory. What we're trying to do is to combine quantum mechanics and relativity, and uh, they don't work, and so we don't, we, we, at this point we are quite lost when we get down here. We're not too sure of all this stuff either, but we're still doing fairly well. <laughs> but here's the great thing, if you, but if you plot the graph this way, you never actually get to zero. You can keep yourself in business for years, going back <laughs> to, the, to the Big Bang. OK, so let's, um, let's, uh, let's imagine we get back to zero. Let's ask the question, very tentatively, what happened before the Big Bang? Well, there's several ways of, uh, of answering, or rather several ways of not answering this question. <laughs> but the, the, the basic thing is that with the, the to a cosmologist, especially one who uh, uses the ideas encompassed in, in Einstein's theory of relativity, there's no meaning to the question of time before the Big Bang. And you can get a sort of feel for why this is. This is not, completely, uh, uh, not a completely perfect argument, but think about it. If there was no matter and no space, there could be no events. And if there are no events, what is the meaning of time? Time is what you measure between events. So that's one way you, if you, might, you might feel comfortable with, um, in, in take, in, with the view that, in fact, time is, is meaningless before that. But there's another way of looking at it that is due to Stephen Hawking, who uh, said, asking what happened before the Big Bang is asking, how do you go further north when you're already at the North Pole? All right? It's a question that doesn't have a real answer. All right, so let me end up then. We've talked a bit about the beginning of time. Let me add a, just a couple of slides. What about the future of time? So, and we can say this about the future of time, is that so long as the universe continues to expand, time will continue. There's no reason to think that time will stop in any way so long as the universe is continuing to expand. But, here's the big but, and this is important for astronomy. This is not just theoretical. This is something that could really be important. Every, all the galaxies in the universe have a gravitational force between them. The gr you don't even need Einstein's theory of relativity to calculate this. You can just use Newton's law of gravity, 300 years old physics. Each galaxy pulls on every other galaxy. And that pull between the galaxies tends to oppose the expansion of the universe. 
Okay. So, and you, one can do calculations on this, and you, what, we, what we find is that if, if there's enough gravity, the whole universe could stop expanding and could then start collapsing again to form what we sometimes call the, the big crunch, which is the opposite of the Big Bang, and will be every, every, every bit of spectacular. Everything will come back together uh, into um, a, 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 an end, and in fact, time, the time as we know it would cease at that point. Well, that's what might happen. Is, so the question is, is gravity strong enough for this to happen? That's a question that we, could, we can answer observationally, or we can try to anyway. So to answer the question, will there be a big crunch in the future? There are two things we can do, and that is we can measure the average density of the universe. And what I mean by that is that if there's a lot of matter, a lot of mass in the universe, there's going to be a lot of gravity, a big tendency for the universe to pull itself together and collapse. And the actual number that, is, uh, that uh, we, one can calculate what we call the critical density. It's what the average density of the universe has to be for there to be enough gravity to make the universe collapse. And that critical density is, is, is actually very low. It corresponds to roughly one hydrogen atom in a volume about the size of this pedestal. In other words, if the whole universe has a density of more than one atom per roughly cubic meter, in approximate numbers, the universe will collapse again. Well, people, uh, astronomers have gone out to try to measure this. They, they count galaxies, uh, measure the forces between galaxies and clusters, try to measure the average density of the universe. It turns out to be very difficult to do. One of the re big reasons why it's so difficult is that the, we now know the universe contains vast amounts of dark matter that we can't see. So we can either try to measure the average density of the universe. Um, this, I say this is very difficult, largely because of the large amounts of uh, dark matter in the universe that uh, confuse things. And if we make this measurement, it really is a bit uncertain whether the universe will uh, collapse or, or keep on going. But there's another thing one can do. An experiment was done a few years ago um, uh, by including, it was done partly by one of the members of the Institute for Astronomy, John Tonnery. Uh, he's a member of a team that did this. And what they tried to do was to measure the expansion rate of the universe in the past. The details we don't need, but the idea was that they were using the same idea of looking back in time by looking at very, very distant galaxies, studying those galaxies, and trying to estimate how fast the universe was expanding in the past. What they expected to find was that the universe was expanding faster in the past than it is now because the expansion is being slowed by, by gravity. But what happened, that they had got a, a, a surprise for, for everybody, what they found was the universe's expansion is actually accelerating. This is a great surprise. Uh, we now talk in terms of something called um, dark energy, which is in some sense works in the opposite uh, direction to gravity. It kind of provides a push rather than a pull. Uh, but the, to explain dark energy and dark matter is, is way beyond the, what time we have for this evening. But what I want to end up with is saying that the, the fact that we find that the universe's expansion is accelerating means that time will probably continue forever. So here are the conclusions, then, of, of what I've been trying to say. First, time is linear. Second, time had a beginning, but probably has no end. And third, time is up. Thank you. <laughs>